Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. I've never been upset during a history video. This is the first time that I am legitimately triggered. All right, part two. It was just too long. I had to get my hat on. Look, watch me. My hat, my, my hat, my chair just, all right. Enough nonsense. All right. Uh, do I have to introduce and everything? My name's Connor. Uh, all the things. All right. You, if you're watching this, you likely watched uh, part one. If you didn't watch, I would recommend it. Okay, let's go. Let's do it. The poor dispositions of the Turner's Irish. two transport groups were protected by his cruiser screening force, which was under the command of British Rear Admiral Victor Crutchley. Guarding the Western approaches, he had a powerful force of six American and Australian cruisers, with four destroyers as escorts. So on paper, the Allied fleet will be more than capable of handling the Japanese. However, since they wanted to guard each no, of the... No, no coffee. Be right back. Okay, sorry. Entrances into the sound. So on paper, the Allied fleet will be more than capable of handling the Japanese. However, since they wanted to guard each of the entrances into the sound, they had divided their forces into two. This, unfortunately, left them in a position to be defeated in detail. The groups were as follows. The Southern group was commanded by Admiral Crutchley himself. It included two Australian ships, his flagship, the Australia, and her sister ship, Canberra. In addition, it had the American cruiser, Chicago, and two destroyers as escorts, Patterson and Bagley. The Northern group was commanded by Captain Reefko. With him were three cruisers, Vincennes, which was his flagship, Quincy, and Astoria. They had two destroyers with them as well, Wilson and Helm. There was also another force I haven't mentioned. It was the Eastern Group under Rear Admiral Scott. It contained a light cruiser and two destroyers. But as events would turn out, they would play no role in the upcoming fight. Regarding the picket screen, it was inadequate. The reason for this was that there were insufficient destroyers available since many were needed to guard the transports against possible submarine attacks. As a result, only two destroyers were stationed to patrol the northwestern approaches, Blue and Ralph Talbot. Crutchley chose those two ships for picket duty after the commander of Destroyer Squadron 4 told him that, of the nine ships in his squadron, 
Blue and Ralph Talbot had consistently obtained the best results with their search radar. And this quote highlights another grave mistake the Allies committed. They were being overly reliant on radar. The Allies were betting on their radar to be able to spot the enemy from afar if it came to attack. However, at this point in the war, the Americans were still inexperienced with this relatively new technology. So despite this high praise of their performance, they failed to live up to it. Neither Blue nor Ralph Talbot discovered Mikawa as he approached. To make matters worse, there was a huge gap of 8 miles between their patrol lines. And at their furthest point, they could be as far as 20 miles apart. And it was by pure luck that Mikawa was able to squeeze through this gap undetected. More Clearly, there are a lot of genius decisions made on all sides of the uh, war that affect the outcome, but I just am blown away by how much, just how much luck has to do with things. Moreover, another point to be discussed is the condition of the sailors. The cruisers had been at general quarters for the past 15 hours, so this night, the exhausted crews would finally be given rest and be placed in condition to readiness meaning that battle stations and guns would be partially manned. Fatigue and weariness could be another factor explaining why Blue never spotted Mikawa's force even when it was just two miles away from her. And to top all of this off, Admiral Crutchley was summoned for a conference that night by Admiral Turner. At 2055, the Australia pulled out of formation. But before she left, Admiral Crutchley signaled Captain Bold of the Chicago. Take charge of the patrol, may or may not rejoin you later. Unfortunately, he did not signal this to Captain Rifko, who technically now was a senior officer. Captain Bold then attempted to get ahead of Canberra so as to lead from the front, but then reconsidered it. It was always tricky maneuvering in the night. Better to just wait a few hours and wait for the Admiral to return. But as events would turn out, Admiral Crutchley never returned that night and would consequently miss out on the battle. Thus, a broken and confused chain of command had been achieved. The overall commander was absent. Captain Bold was in command, but leading from the rear of his group. Captain Rifko was now the senior officer, but didn't know it. And he also didn't know that the commanding admiral was absent. The setup for disaster is now complete. The Allies had failed to detect Mikawa's force heading down the slot. Turner made the wrong assessment based on the intelligence he had, leaving his forces unprepared. The forces had a weak picket screen. The cruiser force was split into two groups. Stations were partially manned, and the overall commander was absent. And what does Mikawa have against this? He has the undisputable number one advantage in a night battle, the element of surprise. Those binoculars. I'm Set against these circumstances, a lot, my eyes we can are see dry. that tragic consequences for the Allies were bound to follow. Pay attention. Mikawa slipped past the blue, and at 0133, he made his final approach into the sound undetected. As he passed Savo Island, a lone ship suddenly appeared on his port side. This was the wound. I just want to say Mikawa was surprised that the blue turned and seemingly didn't see them. But if the blue had seen them, did they expect the blue to attack all of these ships? I mean, wouldn't it have gone away no matter what? Okay. Destroyed, a lone ship suddenly appeared on his port side. Jarvis. This was the wounded destroyer Jarvis. If we recall, she had been heavily damaged yep. in the air raid the day before. Well, now she was exiting the area and by chance found herself on a near collision course with Mikawa. But once again, Mikawa's nerve held and he did not open fire on the destroyer. And to everyone's surprise, the Jarvis simply steamed on. Well, what do you expect it to do? You expect it to engage all of these ships? It's, of course, it's going to relay it to other people. The only explanation for this could be wariness or fatigue, because although she came... I, what do you expect it to do what, what same with the blue i mean you you expect it to just turn and fight incredibly close to the japanese column 
she did not open fire or possibly even spot them. Jarvis was essentially the last hope the Allies had to sound the alarm. The destroyer Yunagi separated from the group to deal with the ship. At 0136, Lookout spotted Canberra and Chicago heading right towards them. There was now nothing standing between Mikawa and the southern group. The moment they had been waiting for had finally come. At this time, high above, the Allies were hearing planes hovering over them. Many had thought they were friendly aircraft, with only a few correctly deducing them as enemies. But even then, the alarm was not raised. It's too late. At anyway. 0143, Patterson spotted the Japanese and sent its now infamous report. Warning, warning, strange ships entering harbor. But it was too late. Four torpedoes from Chukai were already on their way. Long range, huh? A moment later, flares from those mysterious planes were dropped, illuminating the Allied ships. Battle had commenced. Chukai opened fire, followed moments later by the rest of the battle line. All gunfire was directed on the first ship they saw, the Canberra. From only 4,500 yards, a rain of shells started to fall on the unfortunate cruiser. Canberra heroically turned to starboard to put herself- I want to see that in action so bad. Just see my voice cracking. I'm going through puberty again. Just seeing all of these ships just firing everything they have. I've seen a few videos where, you know, I've seen a few guns on modern day battleships fire, but that must have been so crazy. between the enemy and the transports. She tried her best to fight back, but she never had a chance. She was hit by as many as 27 shells, all damaged exclusively on her port side. Her engine room was struck, propulsion and power were lost, and her captain was mortally wounded. There were also some hits below her waterline, and she soon developed a list. Canberra was left dead in the water and engulfed in flames. Especially since all of the shots I feel another voice crack is coming on, especially since all of these shots are on one side. Ooh, I want to learn what's left to some hits starboard. below her waterline and she side as 27 shells, all damaged exclusively on her port side. Many so port is mortally left, moved. starboard right. Canberra was left dead in the water and engulfed in flames. The Chicago veered off and saw torpedoes coming her way. She tried to avoid them, but one, fired by the Kako, hit her on the starboard side. However, the damage was minor as it had only clipped her bow. Moments later, she was struck on her foremast by a six-inch shell. There was confusion in the bridge over what was happening, and her response was slow. Her main guns never got a chance to fire, but her secondary guns did score a hit on the Tendru, causing casualties. Chicago retired to the west and would cease to participate in the battle. Captain Bold would later say that he had been drawn away by some gunfire he saw. What he probably saw was the Yunagi, who at the moment was having a duel with the Jarvis. The wounded destroyer had put up quite a fight with the Yunagi, more than she could handle. And after five minutes, the Japanese destroyer withdrew. However, this was just a skirmish. The main fight was about to begin, and it was to the east of Chicago. Captain Bold committed three mistakes that night. His cruiser, with its fighting capability still intact, steamed away from the main enemy and in effect left the transports he was supposed to protect unguarded. But that wasn't even the worst part. He astonishingly did not send a report or a warning of any kind to the Northern Force. The Fine. Southern Force had been defeated in six minutes. For the most part, the destroyers were ignored. Bagley launched an ineffective torpedo attack and then broke off to the west. The Patterson bravely engaged Tendru and Yubari, all on her own. She hit nothing, but in return received a hit in the aft gun mount and withdrew from the area. By this point, Mikawa had spotted the northern group and already had his formation heading towards it. Captain Riefko in the northern group had heard the gunfire and knew some type of action was occurring with the southern group. But he didn't want to be drawn towards it since it would leave his transports unguarded. Therefore, he decided to maintain station 
and await orders from Admiral Crutchley, which of course never came. So the Northern group continued on their northwest course. But wait, what about Patterson's warning? Well, I, I act like, you know, this is crazy, but communication is not the same as it is today, not even close. Yet. <sighs> when the ships received Patterson's warning, it couldn't have been at a worse time. The ships were busy communicating amongst themselves as they were conducting their northwest turn. As a result, Vincennes got Patterson's warning, but it wasn't delivered to Captain Reefco. Quincy received it, and the Astoria never got it at all. How does all this happen? How, how does... I get a few mis mistakes and lucky things that go in the Japanese way, but it's just getting on my nerve. <laughs> This is too much coincidences and just faulty communication and admirals not being that the head being not the head and, and someone else having to take over and and separating the groups and not seeing the, the care, the not the carrier force, the battleship and destroyer force. In short, 10 minutes into the battle, the northern group was in the same state as the southern group oblivious and unprepared for an enemy that was heading its way. Due to confusion that is inevitable in any battle, Mikawa's column had become disorganized okay, and had finally. split into two. However, this actually gave the Japanese an advantage. The Iron Juggernaut had now transformed into a two-headed monster, and in between the two heads... I shouldn't be rooting for one side. Sorry, I should be looking at this in a historical manner. The all transformed into a two-headed monster, and in between and the two heads the title, lay the unprepared and well. unsuspecting northern group. Wow, really early. The Japanese readied their torpedoes and closed in. They lit up the northern fleet, whose guns were still trained forward. They could see men running on their decks as General Quarters was finally being sounded. And yet, confusion still reigned among the Americans, with many men believing they were Those being lit by friendly ships. Good shot. Vincennes represents this case the best. She began to signal repeatedly, Turn those searchlights off of us! We are friendly! <sighs> Near misses began to fall upon Astoria. Her gunners were quick to respond and immediately returned fire. But then, the captain ordered a ceasefire. <sighs> he had just woken up and stepped into the bridge, and like many others, he feared they were shooting on friendly ships. He was soon convinced otherwise and ordered the guns to resume firing, but his indecision proved fatal. It allowed Chokai to land the first effective salvo. Deservedly so. Successive hits followed and struck Astoria's bow, gun deck, and bridge. Two of her turrets were disabled, foiling any attempt to fight back. Her hangar was then hit where an immense fire started. The Americans would soon discover that their cruisers had a fatal weakness. Their float planes, located on the No, it's just that your leaders are idiots. Well deck and in the hangar were the Achilles heels of their ships. The gasoline, lubricating oil, ordinances, and all other flammable contents that were concentrated and exposed in this area greatly contributed to feeding the fires. I've never been upset during a history video. This is the first time that I am legitimately triggered. Astoria suffered as fires raged uncontrollably and could not be contained. She narrowly avoided colliding with the Quincy, who was also suffering a similar fate. Astoria had become a burning wreck. The coup de grace came of these as Aoba, Kako, and Kinugasa finished her off. Leaders survive. They the forward all engine room was abandoned, and she soon came to a halt. In total, she received anywhere from 34 to 63 hits. The Quincy came under heavy and accurate fire by the Oba. Suddenly, she saw new enemy targets on her port beam. This was the Western Group. 
She turned to starboard when she saw torpedoes heading her way, but she was struck by two from the Tendru. She soon began to receive a barrage of shells and her aft turret was taken out. The catapult was struck and the five planes she had on board went up in flames. The Quincy quickly became an inferno. The most iconic photograph taken of the battle was of the Quincy in her plight. From this view, you can get an idea of how close range this engagement had become. Here we can see that the Quincy is on fire and down by the stern. And yet, despite the damage, she was able to fight back. She got off three salvos during the battle, the last of which hit Chokai's bridge, nearly taking out Mikawa Finally. and his staff. However, she herself was struck in the bridge and her captain was killed. Soon after, her propulsion was lost when she was struck by another torpedo on her starboard side. As many as 54 hits were ultimately scored on the blazing cruiser. And just so you can get an idea of how intense the fires were on the ships, halfway through the battle, the Japanese actually turned off their searchlights because the flaming ships were illuminating the combat area so well. The head of the Northern Fleet, the Vincennes. Look, I get it if this is like a Pearl Harbor situation where you don't even know, you're not at war yet. You, you, you're you not expecting the Japanese to attack you, but you're in a war against the Japanese. I get it. You don't think they're near, but you, you're, if someone's firing at you, you, they searchlighted you, you were pissed off at that, then they sh started shooting at you, and you still thought it might be friendly fire? I just... Took a beating at the onset of the battle. She was initially hit by two torpedoes on her port side, courtesy of Chokai. She fired back and managed to strike the Kinugasa, slightly damaging her. But this was all the damage she would inflict on the enemy. A barrage of shells fell upon her as she was caught in the crossfire from both the eastern and western column. All of her turrets were hit and taken out, testifying to Japanese accuracy and gunnery skills. Does anyone know then, the range of, of these torpedoes? You know, sooner or later, if they don't hit something, they must just lose their um, fuel or whatever is propelling them and just start sinking. Another torpedo struck her port side. Afterwards, more hits followed. Shells struck the main steam lines, the fire mains, and the main battery control. The conning tower was hit, severing communications on the ship, and like the others, her hangar lit up as well. The steering power failed, the electrical system failed, and the flagship of the Northern Group began to fight for her life. It was later calculated that up to 74 shells had struck the ship. The destroyers of the Northern Group played no significant part in the battle. The Helm had fired one salvo at the enemy and then ceased to participate. The Wilson fired at various enemy ships throughout the battle, but didn't register any hits. As planned, the Japanese cruisers began to exit the area. Behind them lay a scene of destruction as three cruisers were fighting for their lives. The only obstacle left for the Japanese force was the picket destroyer Ralph Tobit. Yubari, Tendru, and Furutaka engaged the destroyer. She fought back but wasn't able to score any hits. In the exchange, however, she was hit six times. Fortunately, a rain squall saved the destroyer from assured destruction. At 0220, Mikawa ordered the ships to break off their engagement. The Battle of Savo Island was over. It had been a stunning victory. The enemy forces were destroyed, and from it emerged an opportunity. I'm sorry, guys. I let my emotions get the best of me, and I'm not looking. I wasn't looking at it as an unbiased viewpoint. Okay. To turn this tactical victory into a strategic one, the transports were now exposed and vulnerable to attack. Mikawa had a decision to make, and it was over the following choices: Should he head back and destroy the transports? or should he withdraw? We will call this Mikawa's predicament, and it occurred from 0215 to 0223. It seems like the Americans are severely 
are not doing well. So I would I would gamble going back and destroying everything unless what was left wasn't worth it. Mikawa took stock of his situation and pondered over his options. There were some factors in favor for attacking. First, Mikawa's force was reasonably stocked. They still had over 60% of their gun ammunition and 50% of their torpedoes left. That's insane. And second, there stood little in the way of him achieving this goal since the main screening force had been destroyed. In short, if he attempted to go for the transports, he would likely be successful. However, there were also many reasons not to attack. Fuel? To begin with, the single hit on Chokai by the Quincy was truly a lucky shot, for it had destroyed the charts and maps Mikawa needed to navigate safely in the sound. But the biggest concern was time. Dawn was not far off. It was calculated that it would take an hour and a half to reassemble and reverse course to enter the sound again. Then, another hour to reach the transports. I'm just this meant that at best, he could commence an attack around 0500, leaving him only an hour of darkness before sunrise. If he attacked at that time, he wouldn't be withdrawing back home under the cover of darkness. He would be exposed in daylight hours. And it was certain that he would have to face the wrath of American carrier airplanes True. during his retreat. Actually, I changed my mind. It, you, you lost all of your carriers in Midway. You just had a very nice victory. I don't think they lost a single... They didn't lose a single ship. And they got a lot of casualties, uh, a lot of ship casualties. And um, you don't want to, you know, maybe risk losing one ship, even if you do are able to sink, you know, two or three. Mikawa was well aware of what could happen to a surface force without air cover when attacked by carrier-based bombers. He was bound to suffer heavy losses, if not outright destruction. Now, at this point, it's even. Two in favor, two against. But if we really want to get into Mikawa's mindset, then there were probably some other factors weighing heavily on his mind in favor of withdrawing that we have to consider. Before he of withdrawing that we have to consider. Before he had left drawing that we have to consider. Sea control has been established. Transport will have to withdraw. Before he had left for Rabaul, he had spoken with the chief of the Naval General Staff, Admiral Osami Nagano. He had been told by him that since Japan's industrial power was meager, he was to avoid losing his ships as they could not easily be replaced. He was at the moment in possession of a third of all the heavy cruisers the Japanese Navy had. Moreover, was that the Japanese Navy So is he cruiser... the Nimitz equivalent? Is Nagano Osami the, uh, like the, the head chief of the Na Naval General Staff? Is he like the head of all of the Japanese Navy? The Japanese Navy had. Moreover, was that the Japanese Imperial Army had already boasted to him how they would defeat the Americans soon enough. His mission was to take care of the Navy, which he had done, and they would take care of the Marines. So going for the transports wouldn't have been necessary given that promise. And finally, it's important not to forget that Mikawa was an old school commander. So Marines aren't part, I'm gonna sound really stupid, but it's Marines aren't part of the Navy, so are Marines part of the army or are they their own separate branch that's kind of in between? Like they're not purely, you know, an aquatic force, they're not purely a land force, they're like uh, an invading kind of force from sea. Who adhered to the Imperial Navy's concept of sea control. It stated that what was most important was to destroy the enemy's warships, which would give you dominance of the seas, which in turn meant control of the island. So in his mind, he must have thought, hmm, I have already made it. Now without a screening force, the transports will have to withdraw regardless. So Mikawa must have wondered, why risk his fleet? This was Mikawa's predicament between 0215 and 0223. 
And I would ask the viewer, if you were in Mikawa's shoes, which option would you have taken? Against. At first, I was thinking in favor because of the ineptitude of American, you know, ship leaders, commanders on the ships. And you've been doing so well and they've been messing up. They clearly aren't on their game, the Americans, and you clearly are. You have plenty of ammunition. He didn't say anything about the fuel, so I'll guess he has enough to uh, go if he has to. But after taking a second and thinking about their bigger picture, no more carriers. They just got a good victory. Why risk um, something else where the way you're going to be able to win against America, who has much more... Wait, do they have much more ships? They at least have carriers. Is a lot of quick harassment attacks. I would wait. I'd go uh, the against option. Taken. Go back and enlarge your victory by destroying these transports, but then risk losing your precious cruisers to inevitable air attacks during the retreat. It was already a huge victory. Or be content with what you already have achieved and not press your luck. Yep. Go home now and lessen the chance of an airstrike reaching your cruisers. His channel is great with that. Putting your, putting the viewer in the shoes of the Mikawa deliberated maker. with his staff, and at 0223, he made his decision. He would play it safe. He ordered a withdrawal. Smart. The irony, however, Thanks. was that the American carrier force, the one he was so scared of, was already on its way out of the operational area. Well, he didn't know that. Vice Admiral Fletcher, in one of his most controversial decisions of his career, had ordered his carriers to be withdrawn the previous evening. Therefore, if Mikawa had decided to go with the gamble of attacking the transports, he could have done it and his force would have escaped unmolested during the day. This is one of the greatest what-ifs of the Guadalcanal campaign. But who could blame him? We today have the benefit of hindsight, while Mikawa had to act on the information at hand. That's so important in learning about history and it cannot be stated enough. Hindsight. In 1957, Mikawa would state that had he known the Americans would have never been dislodged by the Japanese army and that the American carriers had withdrawn, then of course he would have attacked. But based on the information he had, he didn't. And he therefore felt he had made... Of course, if you added to that pro-side chart the fact that the carrier troop withdrew, then there's almost no downside. So, yeah. ...made the right decision. It could... And he therefore felt he had made the right decision. It could be said that Mikawa failed to recognize the scale of the landings and to assess that this was a vital opportunity that had been presented to him. Although I personally think it's a bit unfair. He didn't possess a crystal ball that told him how important and how tough the struggle for the island would become. Most of us only know that through hindsight. Either way, to see the grand opportunity that- he, With a similar uh, Montemayor, as he does very well place us in the shoes of uh, the Japanese, you know, from the Japanese perspective video of Midway, there was this one point where he did the same thing. He made the pro-con chart and asked you to to do something it was or what you would do and it was would you allow the carrier strike force that struck Pearl Harbor or Midway um, sorry Midway to uh, come back and land or would you have your reserve planes go out and uh, look for what they thought was a carrier but that wasn't a flip of the coin like this one not even flip of the coin that assumes it's 50 50 this in this scenario we had no idea we had no information to tell us, to even give us a, um, an educated guess as to where the carrier group might be. In that situation, it, it, they were in a strange position. They knew there were ships. They just weren't sure if there were carriers. They were riding against the wind, which would suggest that in this weird position, going against the wind might be a very good chance that there are carriers, since carriers have to do that in order to have a better chance of lifting the planes or the planes getting lift to take off but this one is not the same scenario we, you, there was no kind of educated guess 
it was just a guess, so I think it was a good choice. Had been presented, I believe author Mark Stilley summed it up perfectly. Mikawa did not know it at the time, but he had just squandered the IJN's best chance of delivering a knockout blow to the first American offensive in the Pacific. It is hard to imagine the Americans holding on to their lodgment following the destruction of their transport fleet and the supplies still on board. Yeah, that... The destruction of the American transports would have been worth the sacrifice of Mikawa's entire force. That being said, even to this day, some may... But would, it, let's say that they, he, again, he doesn't know where the carrier group is. Let's say he goes back in and he loses half of his ships. And let's say he goes back in and he wipes out them all, but loses all of his ships. Is, is that worth it? Is, is that, you know? He still what you said, even to this day, some may still question Mikawa's decision. What do you think? Did Mikawa make the right call? Yeah, I do. Uh, obviously, with the information that we know, no, he didn't make the right call, but he didn't know that. We didn't know that. And you could say, oh, that this was a, a key moment where you were down carriers, you lost all your carriers in midway, and you have to make an aggressive move. Well, this was all already an aggressive move. He going through the slot and going over there was already extremely aggressive, and it paid off. Why take the chance of going for a complete knockout where uh, you could have lost everything? You know, like. At 0223, Mikawa's force departed, leaving behind a scene of devastation. The damage had been catastrophic and fatal to the Allied ships. The Quincy was the first to sink 15 minutes after Mikawa's departure at 0235. 370 men were lost. The Vincennes sank at 0250, taking 332 of her crew. Come the following morning, Canberra was still afloat and it looked like she might be saved. However, a major withdrawal of all the naval forces was underway, and it was ordered that if she couldn't make the departure, she should be scuttled. So she was. She sank at 0800, 73 men died. I'm assuming, pro I'm assuming prior to the scuttle, right? I mean. The last to go was the Astoria. She sank in the afternoon at 1215. 216 sailors went down with the ship. This was the worst defeat of the United States Navy in the Pacific War. The final score, four cruisers were sunk and a fifth damaged. In addition, two destroyers were also damaged. 1,077 men were killed, 709 wounded. What is striking about the losses is that almost as many sailors died on this one day as Marines during the entire six-month Guadalcanal campaign. That's how vicious this battle was. For the Japanese, the losses were minimal. Three ships were damaged, 35 men were killed, and 51 wounded. That's Although insane. not a strategic victory because Mikawa hadn't destroyed the transports, there can be no denying that it had been a smashing, tactical victory for the Japanese. Well done. The Battle of Sabo Island was the greatest Japanese surface combat victory of the war. It demonstrated to the Americans that the IJN surface fleet packed a mean punch and that they were superb night fighters. This engagement would be the first of many intense battles for control of the waters off Guadalcanal. In fact, so many ships would end up sinking in Savo Sound that it would soon acquire a new name, Iron Bottom Sound. And remember, the Guadalcanal campaign had only just begun. On August 9th, Turner and his transport ships withdrew from the Sound. But I want to be clear about something. The Allies were not pulling out because of Mikawa's victory. 
they were withdrawing because they didn't have any more air cover thanks to Admiral Fletcher's decision to withdraw his carriers the evening before. As a matter of fact, the conference they had right before the battle, the conference that led to Admiral Crutchley being absent from the battle, was to discuss that very issue of Fletcher withdrawing. You see, Turner had been in a dilemma. They still hadn't finished unloading all of the supplies for the ground forces. But now without air cover, the transports would be vulnerable to an air attack if the Japanese followed on as they had done so for the previous two days. Therefore, the decision was made that night, before Mikawa had even entered the sound, that they would withdraw the following day. So, by the evening of August 9th, Sabo Sound was empty of any Allied ships. Left behind were 17,000 Marines who were short on food, ammunition, and supplies. The Marines would be on their own for now. Lessons learned. Regarding Admiral Turner's performance, I hope I didn't come off too harsh on him because admittedly he was in a tough spot. He had very limited intelligence due to the breakdown of communications. Clearly, he cannot be faulted for this. But what he was guilty of was making the wrong assessment. He tried to guess what the enemy would do instead of preparing for the enemy's most dangerous course. Mikawa, on the other hand, did many things right, but let's admit, he was aided a lot by luck. He showed initiative, kept the plan simple, and was opportunistic to take advantage of all the failures the Allies committed. But what really helped them was the following, and I hope I made the case clear by now, that the primary reason for the Allied defeat was because of the element of surprise the Japanese had coming into the battle. In these night battles, surprise would play a crucial role in favor of the victor. You can also say the reason for Allied defeat is their inability to construct productive reconnaissance missions. Just two months later, we will see how the Americans had surprise on their side and how they decisively turned the tables against the former victors. Did that's it. Just two months later, we will see how the Americans had surprise on okay, their side. Okay, so there's another And video. how they decisively turned the tables against the former victors. That said, I'm convinced that if only Mikawa had been spotted earlier, and if he hadn't had the factor of surprise, the Allies would have fared better. Yeah. Mikawa and his men, for their part, were ecstatic with the victory they had achieved. They would soon get a hero's welcome when they returned to base. As they should. However, their euphoria was cut short when the Americans unsuspectedly obtained revenge. On August 10th, submarine S-44 had been on patrol near New Ireland when it spotted Cruiser Division 6 returning to Cavain. She fired four torpedoes. And Sorry, I just finished watching Das Boot a few days ago. Such a great movie, I highly recommend it. Melkor was one who suggested, thank you for that, and so it's cool seeing this. And three of them hit the Kako. The Kako sank that morning, 68 men were lost. At least he got that. However, remember that wounded destroyer, the Jarvis? She had a grim and final role to play in this story. She was on her way back to Australia for repairs when a Japanese search plane misidentified her as a cruiser. A Japanese airstrike was already airborne, heading to attack the shipping in Iron Bottom Sound. Much to the relief of Turner and his unprotected ships, the strike never arrived, but this was only because when it had been Jarvis. redirected to this new target. The Jarvis, limping along at seven knots, had no working radio, and worst of all, to help lighten the weight, had gotten rid of her lifeboats. At noon, 16 Betty Bombers approached the Ill Star Destroyer. She would give a good account of herself, shooting down two bombers and causing another to crash land later on. Nonetheless, the odds against her were simply too great. She was sunk with all hands. It was going to be the start of a vicious campaign indeed. A topic that cannot be dismissed. Was Canberra hit by friendly fire? It has come to light in the last decades that the Canberra had been a victim of friendly fire, the culprit being Bagley, 
who launched torpedoes at the Japanese. When one looks at the track charts, if Bagley had been at its appropriate station, it would have been close, but not really in a position to do so. However, all one must do is imagine Bagley had been further aft of her proper station, which many claim she was. Well, given that course, we can see that at 0147, it was possible her torpedo spread could have hit the Canberra. All I will say is this. If true, then unquestionably, August 9th had to be one of the unluckiest days for the Allies, because it meant that on one of the rarest occasions, the deficient, infamously unreliable Mark 15 torpedo worked, it had been on a friendly ship. All right, if you made it this far, thank you for watching. Thank you I for hope making. you enjoyed the video, and I'll see you next time as I continue on with the naval battles of the Guadalcanal campaign. Awesome video, great channel, putting you in the shoes of uh, the commanders and letting you uh, try and see what you would do before they give you all of the information that the commanders didn't have. Such a great channel. If there are more videos, which I believe there are, I will absolutely re react to those. Hope you guys are all doing well. If not, you'll be good soon. Emotions are fickle, my friend. Follow my TikTok.